think I'm going to go ahead and call our regular meeting of the Unover County Board of Education to order because I know we have an energetic group of singers that I'm looking forward to hearing out there. So I want to go ahead and get them in here. So if they would come on in, once they get in position, if everyone would please stand for the invocation and remain standing for the presentation of the colors, uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and then the posting of our colors. Please stand. We now have our invocation. Lord, we thank you for this day, this opportunity to come together. We ask your blessings and guidance on all that takes place here tonight. Make us ever mindful of the needs of others and grant us wisdom uh, as needed. And we are especially appreciative of the young people that we're honored to serve and having uh, such an outstanding sampling of our young people here tonight, those singing and those also uh, presenting our colors. In your holy name we pray, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. If the you have microphones over here, Mr. Bills, he has it. Sorry, just gave it to me. Okay. If the children one by one could give us their name uh, in the grade they're in, we know it's Eden Elementary School. So if they would give us their name in the grade they're in. Uh, but before we do that, I know the audience wants to give a round of applause for that terrific singing. <laughs> now, if they could tell us who they are. My name is Mandy Dajewski, and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Grace Holker, and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Tanner Willis, and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Ross Bueller, and I'm in fifth grade. My name is A.J. Fitzik, and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Evan Fitzig, and I'm, on, and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Reno Harris Roman, and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Slim Fleming Kiki, and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Annalise Galmore, I'm in fifth grade. 
My name's Amelia Ponis and I'm in fifth grade. My name's Alyssa Rainer and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Lara Simpson and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Samantha Lewis and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Aislinn O'Donnell and, I'm in, and I am in fifth grade. My name is Guy and Lee and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Mary McConnell and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Ty Jackson and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Julia Ladder and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Bailey Avey and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Keenan Stewart and I'm in fifth grade. And if the instructor would introduce herself, please. <laughs> I thought I missed it. Uh, and I'm Carly Kanzler, and I'm the music teacher at Eaton Elementary. I am John Holbrook. I am in sixth grade, and I go to Myrtle Grove Christian School. My name is Chase Gaskins. I'm in sixth grade, and I am homeschool, and I go to Best New Stones Academy. I'm Cody Huffman. I go to, I'm in eighth grade, and I'm in Murray Middle School. I'm Brandon Kelly. I'm in 10th grade and I go to Pender Early College. Thank you again. Before he leaves the room, I would all there he is standing up to the right. Mr. Steve Bilsey, would you wave so people know who you are? I appreciate the fact that Mr. Bilsey the two, two board meetings in a row now has brought in the, his Boy Scout troop to present our colors. We normally have a color guard from one of our high schools that present the colors, but during the summer, uh, we asked for outside help and Mr. Bilsey has been gracious uh, enough to help us in our last two meetings. So Mr. Bilsey, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Also, I don't know if I saw her, but I wanted to also recognize the principal of Eaton Elementary School, Ms. Heather Byers. I don't know if I see her. I didn't see her. Uh, nope. Okay. She's uh, out of town today. Oh, out of town? Yeah. All righty. At this time, Ms. White, will you please call the roll? Donald S. Hayes. Here. Jeanette S. Here. Nichols. Here. Janice A. Kavanaugh. Tammy J. Kogel. Here. Lisa Eastap. Here. Derek G. Hickey. Here. Sorry, see you, Sloan. Edward B. Higgins, Jr. Here. Thank you. Uh, item two on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Any changes Just to our agenda? Just a note of closed session at the end. Okay. We need to state the purpose now as far as personnel. Personnel and legal. Personnel and legal would be the reasons, Mr. Bowler. If you will supply. Excuse me, sir. For personnel, our closed session. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. And when you make the motion, I'll give you the site. Okay. Time. Next item on the agenda is item three, is approval of the minutes. Uh, would you like to do all these at one time or individually? All at once. Okay. Item A is the uh, approval for our interim meeting, June 19th, 2013. Item B is our regular meeting, July the 2nd, 2013. Item C is our work session on July the 17th, 2013. And our board retreat, item D, on July the 24th, 2013. Move for approval. Second. Comments, questions? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? They are approved. Item four is recognition of achievement. Good evening, everyone. At this time, it's my privilege to uh, recognize our awards for this evening, recognitions. Tonight, we have the opportunity to recognize three of our schools, and they are Coddington Elementary, Pine Valley, Pine Valley Elementary and Holly Shelter Middle School. These schools have achieved the 2013 Healthy Schools Program Bronze Award by the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. To earn this national recognition, these schools have improved nutrition services and physical activity programs to meet or exceed the stringent standards set by the Alliance for a Healthier Generation's 
Healthy Schools Program. So when I call your name, would you please come forward to be recognized for your outstanding efforts in establishing and supporting a healthy lifestyle focus in your school. Our first school is Coddington Elementary, and we would like to add, um, ask for the former principal, Mr. Bud Dingwall, and also our current principal, Mr. Eric Berman, and his team to please come forward. Congratulations. And from Pine Valley Elementary School, with Mrs. Rebecca Opgren and her team, please come forward. And last but not least, we'd like to recognize Holly Shelter Middle School with Dr. Sherry Pinto and her team. Please come forward. Congratulations to all of these schools for choosing a healthy lifestyle for our students. Mr. Hayes? This time I'd like to ask the full board if you would please come out and help with the presentation of our next award. As the board comes forward, this is a momentous occasion. This is a very special award that the board is about to present. This is a newly created award that will be presented by the board periodically. And this award will be presented to New Hanover County Schools employees and students who have committed heroic acts. And recipients of the award will meet established criteria and their acts will be verified for authenticity. And the board is very proud of its Heroes Award and they look forward to acknowledging the district's heroes. So now for our very first Heroes Award. This inaugural award is being presented to Parsley Elementary School and eight outstanding school employees for their heroic efforts that occurred on May 23rd. And I'll tell you what happened. I'm so proud, Ms. Hamilton. The Parsley team acted quickly to help save a grandparent during school dismissal. A perceptive employee at Parsley noticed that the grandparent seemed disoriented and she helped him into the building. But by the time they reached the school, the gentleman collapsed and he was unresponsive. His condition rapidly declined. Parsley team members immediately began CPR and chest compressions. Emergency personnel arrived and the gentleman was transported to the hospital. And a few days following the incident, the gentleman's daughter contacted our public information office to tell us what Parsley employees did to help save her father's life. And the family stated that they are most grateful for this heroic act. So therefore, it's my honor at this time to recognize our outstanding Parsley Elementary School team for their quick response, for their compassion for others, and willingness to take charge of a critical situation, which combined to help save an individual's life. So Parsley team members, would you please come forward to receive the first New Hanover County Board of Education Heroes Award. I will call your names. Frank, Frankie Mincy, the school nurse. Sarah Marion, counselor. Elizabeth Weir, teacher assistant. 
Sophia Smith, teacher assistant. Lindsay Farland, teacher. Arlene Suggs, assistant principal. Chris Boberg, teacher. Tim Winstead, teacher assistant. And of course, our fabulous principal, Dr. Robin Hamilton. Thank you for leading an incredible team. Congratulations, thank you, Parsley. And our next Hero Awards recipient is a New Hanover High School student. He's a junior by the name of Devin Mercer. Is Devin here tonight? Let me tell you about Devin. Devin is a member of the New Hanover High School swim team and Devin happened to be swimming at the Legion Stadium's pool in mid-June when he recognized that a younger swimmer was in trouble at the bottom of the pool. Devin swam to the bottom and saw that the swimmer was unresponsive. Then he gathered up the swimmer and swam with him to the surface where he got help from the lifeguard. The lifeguard immediately began CPR and 911 was called. Due to Devin's efforts, the young man that he saved survived Medical experts told us that the young swimmer most likely would not have survived if he had been underwater much longer. Therefore, it is our distinct honor this evening to recognize Devin for his quick response, his compassion for others, and willingness to take charge of a critical situation which combined to save a person's life. Devin, we um, honor you with this New Hanover County Board of Education Heroes Award, and I'd also like for Devin's family, if they are here, would you please stand, Mr. Kevin Mercer and Mrs. Tamara Mercer. Congratulations. Let us give another round of applause to this outstanding young man. I'd like to thank the board for allowing me to do this too. Thank you. And that concludes our award ceremony. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Thank you. After that start, after the singing, after the recognition of the heroes, I 
really would just like to adjourn and we'll all go home now. Uh, works for me. <laughs> I'll motion. Second. But one motion and approve the agenda and we'll go home. <laughs> That's really nice. We're, uh, we're proud of the, the Heroes Award. We uh, uh, certainly want to recognize that type of uh, uh, heroism, uh, really, that uh, I'm not going down, I don't think. Uh, but that was very nice. Uh, item five on our agenda is our call to the audience. No one has signed up, so we'll move to item six. Administrative personnel, administrative recommendations, appendix A, Dr. Markley. All right, we have a number of administrative recommendations. It's that time of year, folks. Uh, the first recommendation is for Ms. Amy Conklin, who has been serving as interim principal at Mary C. Williams, to, uh, to remove the interim tag and remain as the permanent principal at Mary C. Williams. She has served as a mentor in the Human Resources Department, a teacher at Parsley. Prior to that, she taught in Wake County. The administrative contract will be effective until June 30th, 2015. She holds a master's degree from the University of North Carolina in Wilmington and a bachelor's degree in communications from North Carolina State University. Move for approval. Second. Comments, questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Ms. Conklin, if you please stand. I want to thank you for what you've done. <laughs> I, I would say welcome aboard, but you're already aboard, so <laughs> congratulations. She, she filled in that it's had a very difficult situation, yeah. and uh, it's a pleasure to, to have recommended it. Next, we can move to assistant principal recommendations. The first is Mr. David Greenwood. Uh, he is being approved as the uh, requested as assistant principal at College Park Elementary School. Uh, prior to employment, he has worked with us as an in-school suspension coordinator at Middle Grove. Prior to that, he taught for 30 years at West Middle School uh, in Plymouth Canton Community Schools in Michigan. His administrative contract will be effective until June 30th, 2015. He has a master's in ed leadership from Eastern Wayne, Michigan, and a bachelor's of arts degrees in physical education from Wayne State in Detroit. Move for approval. Second. Comments, questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is approved. Mr. Greenwood. <laughs> Any guests with you, Mr. Greenwood? Pardon? Is there a guest with you? <laughs> My new principal that I'm working with, Marie Green. Green and Greenwood, that's going to be a combination. <laughs> Our next recommendation is Ms. Kimberly Horton. She's recommended for the assistant principal position at Williston Middle School. Ms. Horton recently completed her administrative internship at Winter Park and Leland Middle. Previously, she was a teacher at Alderman School and Noble Middle School. Her contract will be effective until June 30th, 2015. She has a master's in school administration from North Carolina Wilmington and a bachelor of arts in middle grade education also from UNCW. Move for approval. Second. Comments, questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Ms. Horton? It's approved, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Rose. Elementary assistant school principal recommendation for Bellamy Elementary, Ms. Jana Lennon. Uh, Ms. Lennon is currently a teacher at Coddington Elementary School where she completed her administrative internship. She also served as a teacher at Pine Valley Elementary. Her contract will be effective until June 30th, 2015. She's received a master's degree in both school administration and elementary ed from the University of North Carolina at Wilmington and a Bachelor of Arts degree in elementary ed from Meredith College in Raleigh, North Carolina. Move Oop. for approval. Second. Comments, questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. All right, Ms. Lennon, welcome. <laughs> Do you have any guests with you? <laughs> Welcome aboard. Our next recommendation is for assistant principal at Forest Hills Global School. The recommendation is Dolores Overby. Um, Ms. Overby completed her administrative internship at Anderson and Murray and previously was the AIG teacher and coach for Anderson Elementary School. She was also a teacher at Bellamy Elementary prior and prior to joining New Hanover was a teacher at Johnston County and Richmond County Schools. Her contract will be effective until June 30th, 2015. 
She received her master's in school administration from Gardner-Webb and her bachelor's in science and elementary ed from East Carolina University. Move for approval. Second. Comments, questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. Ms. Overby? Now, <laughs> now, I know you got a couple of guests with you. I know you got some guests with you back there. Next is the assistant principal recommendation for John T. Hoggart High School. The recommendation is Margaret Rollison. Ms. Rollison served previously as the assistant principal at Heidi Trask in Pender County. Uh, Ms. Rollins also taught math and was a turnaround coordinator for North Brunswick High School in Brunswick County. She began her teaching career in Rowan County as a teacher for North Rowan Middle. And her administrative contract will be in effect until June 2015. Ms. Rollison received a doctorate degree in education and a master's degree in education from UNCW and a bachelor of science degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Move for approval. Second. Second. Comments, questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. Ms. Rollison, welcome aboard. <laughs> Any guests with you? Steve, anyone else you want to steal from Pender? I'm still working on a few more. Welcome aboard. Our final recommendation of the evening is Ms. Christy Swan to be the assistant principal at Williston Middle School. Ms. Swan has served as a curriculum coach and integrated specialist at the Brunswick uh, County Academy for middle and high school students. Previously, she was a fine arts teacher at Northampton County and an adjunct professor for Chowan University. She also taught music and drama for Gates County and Hertford County. Her administrative contract will be in effect until June 30th, 2015. She has a master's degree and a bachelor's degree in music and education from East Carolina. She also completed her administrative licensure uh, program through ECU in 2013. Move for approval. Second. Second. Comments, questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. Is Ms. Swan here? Welcome aboard. <laughs> and Dr. Oates, your principal, is here. That concludes the administrative recommendations. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda, um, item seven, under information, uh, policies on for a first reading, Mrs. Mills. The first policy is a new policy from technology, um, and this is acceptable use of personally owned devices, be your own, bring your own device to school. I'm gonna ask Ms. Brinson if she will share a little bit about how what we've done before we started this policy. Okay, thank you. In light of what's been, you know, the changes in technology and the move for school systems to support the bring your own device, what we have done last year before we brought this policy to the board is kind of decide we need to do a pilot. So we actually had some teachers at elementary, middle, and high school level willing to pilot you know, the students bringing their own device. So um, we worked closely with them. They sent letter homes to the, letters home to the parents explaining what they were doing in class. They kind of were our, our, um, our little test environment to kind of see what we need to do. Because it's not just about the policy, but it's also about the procedures. And it was important for the teachers to inform the parents what the devices were going to be used for and then also manage, you know, how are they going to manage the devices in the school, locking them up, securing them, when the kids are going to pull them out, when they're not going to pull them out, how they're going to use them, what they're going to use them with. So we gained some information from those teachers, and I'll be providing that information to principals for you to give to your teachers to think about before they start having their kids bring devices to school. Um, but then we did come up with this policy, and kind of this is a, a just combined of lots of research, pulling things together of how we feel like the, um, the policy should read for New Hanover County Schools and bring in the device. Thank you, Mrs. Brinson. I have one question. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not necessarily the most computer literate person, so this may be a, a dumb question to ask. But there are no dumb questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, sometimes. Um, if, if I bring my own device to school and I am 
using the school's Wi-Fi to connect to something. Mm -hmm. Is there any possibility of feedback that would potentially allow a virus to be uploaded via going back, I mean, through that Wi-Fi? The possibility is always there. Um, we have those segmented, our guest wireless, which is what the kids would have, and a student, volunteer, or teacher who brings their personal device in would use the guest wireless, which feeds them directly out to the internet. They can't log in and access any files on the server, okay? So the possibility is always there because people are creating new viruses all the time, but we have limited that by the access that they're allowed to have on the network. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Mrs. Brinson. The next category comes from operations, and that's Mr. Pence's office. I'm going to ask if he will share the changes to these um, policies. And we have a new one as well. Yes, thank you, Ms. Nichols. Uh, the first one is a uh, child nutrition uh, charge policy. It's 4425. It is a uh, new policy uh, relating to uh, charges of uh, meals for students and um, it's a, in an effort to get a handle on uh, the charges we have uh, at any one given time we can have as much as uh, you know thousands and thousands of dollars that are that are charged to the child nutrition program or charged to the schools for the meals and this is a policy that puts um, procedures and processes in place to collect those fees Any questions on that particular policy? Any questions? <coughs> the okay. next one is energy conservation. Uh, I'll move on to, yes, to the energy conservation policy. We had an energy, energy conservation policy in place, and it is uh, 4240. Uh, uh, 42, 40. um, this is um, uh, a change, a significant change to that policy. We beefed it up to more, rep, uh, more um, so it would represent more our program that we're currently uh, involved in from an energy standpoint and uh, so that it will emphasize uh, the boards and the administration's uh, emphasis and support for uh, energy conservation throughout the, throughout the system. <clears throat> and it is a uh, uh, significant change to the policy, but it is part of the revision that we've been going through and the updating uh, and revising of all of our policies. Uh, the next policy is policy 4300, uh, student transportation services. Um, it is a current policy, and this is just a revision and an update of the policy. There's very little change uh, to, this, uh, to this policy. It was last changed in uh, 1995, so this is a revision and update to it. The next policy is 4310, and it was totally deleted. <clears throat> there are uh, general statutes which govern uh, the school bus maintenance, so there's just no need for that particular policy. The next policy is uh, 4320, a school bus uh, operation during uh, hazardous conditions. <coughs> it was last updated in uh, 1995, and this is a revision, and it's uh, very uh, minor uh, changes to it. You can see there that uh, we just changed the, uh, to the Board of Education, uh, added designee for the superintendent, and very, very little change to it. Next policy is policy 4330. It's a school bus uh, safety program. Uh, we did make a few changes to this, but not many. We added a second bullet there. Um, uh, although that had uh, the uh, evacuation uh, procedures and um, had been uh, carried out by the bus drivers and the training, uh, we wanted to put it in the policy because it was not there. So once again, this is updated. The last time it was uh, updated and revised was 1995. Next policy is school bus idling, and it's policy 4335. And uh, it was uh, put in place in 2005, so there's uh, very little change there, a word or two, and that's about it. However, the legal reference was changed. Next policy is a child nutrition policy, policy 4405, foods and schools. And we did uh, make some changes to this because uh, the uh, Healthy Hunger Free 
uh, Kids Act of 2010 has come into existence since this was uh, originally put in place, and this was originally put in place in 2006. Uh, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids uh, Act of 2010 uh, has language in there and it's referenced, so therefore we've taken out some of the language that's in the policy so as not to be redundant since we referenced the, the statute. Otherwise, it's uh, pretty much as, uh, as it originally uh, was placed. The uh, next policy is a child nutrition procurement policy and it is policy 4410. Uh, we have uh, brought this policy, we made a significant changes to this policy. We've eliminated a, a large amount of it and we brought it into alignment with uh, the board policy 4610 and our policy 3410. And so it is in alignment with that and we're not uh, duplicating any language here. So a lot of it is, uh, has been deleted because we are uh, following the uh, standard procurement policies of the school system. Do you have any questions in this category? I have one question. Mr. Hans, just going back a, a segment to the policy 4425, Child Nutrition Charge Policy, mm -hmm. just to uh, give people sort of a scope of the problem, how much was the school system owed, or the I guess the uh, child nutrition owed at the close of last school year, which are charges that were not paid? I. I think, Imer, do you have that figure, the exact figure? I think it was over a hundred thousand. Yeah, hundred and twenty two thousand. Yeah, hundred is over a hundred. Hundred and twenty two thousand dollars. So it's significant. How many chocolate milks is that? <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a few. That's a lot, lot of chocolate. That's a lot of chocolate. chocolate. So we need to we need to fix this. <clears throat> yes. Yes. A hundred and twenty two thousand dollars. Because I was I didn't realize that uh, because I remember years ago, if a child didn't have, forgot their lunch money or whatever, they would give them what the kid referred to as a choke, which was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a carton of milk. But I see we're no longer doing that. You, you have to furnish the meal. The child cannot charge it, so therefore the school, now that 122000 I guess that represents all of our schools. Yes. Be interested. I'd, I'd, I'd like to see, Dr. Hickey, that uh, and this, where most of that's occurring. And, and this has got to be people who do not qualify for yeah. free and reduced lunch so I mean yeah because I know in the policy it stated that the principal would confer with the parents and maybe that's a route they need to go and make them aware of, of all that information well part of this is the same is uh, the, this is part of the rationale for the change the process has been kind of centralized in Imer's office in terms of trying to collect some of these fees and we're trying to push it out to the schools a little more for them to be more proactive with us to, to collect some of these lost fees Correct me if I'm wrong, Imer, high schools are, the, are, are usually our largest uh, accounts that are. Well, is, there, is there anything we can do legally, like withhold diplomas or not send transcripts unless we... Yeah, if you, in, in most cases, cards. high school principals will not, will, will, if you owe any fee, not just the lunch fees, you don't walk until you, until you clear all the books. That's part of the, the graduation but, process. But not in the lower grades. But the, the, in, you can't... You can withhold a report card. No, legally you can't hold, withhold a report mm -hmm. card. It's still $122,000, and I mean, if, we're not, if that's happening mostly at the high schools, and I guess there's a lot of kids who don't want to walk. I mean, you know, I don't know. But. We can give you a school by school breakdown as well. Well, it's fine. It's just I'm glad we need mm -hmm. to sort of tighten this up. I'm glad we're doing that because that's a, that's a mm -hmm. lot of money that could be spent elsewhere. Yeah, yeah and it's been a, a number that's increased over the last two years. <coughs> the economy obviously has played a part in this. If you would ask for this number two years ago, it wouldn't have been anywhere near this. You're right. It, it has increased significantly in the last few years. Yeah. Now, now, as far as our policy, if you come up, we'll, you'll, we, we will give you the basic meal. If that's, I mean, we're not going to deny lunch to a child. No, we should. Yeah, I'm just saying. We, we, need, we sometimes we do some of these policies and people just think, well, why are they making a big deal of this? Uh, you know, child, the whole policy on child nutrition charging, I mean, it seems like overkill until you realize it's a $122,000 problem. And all of a sudden, okay, well, that makes sense why, why we're doing this. And it's a part mm -hmm. of a function of our size. I mean, that's an average of, with 25,000 students, about, it's an average of about $4 a student. Mm -hmm. Well, how are we overcoming that? Because I know you have to be self-sufficient. How are we overcoming the 122,000? The system has. Oh, go ahead. And I know you're, you're, Ms. Smith, you're good and all that, but are you? I mean, I don't know how you can just 
get blood it's, out of a turnip or the, whatever. The state requires that um, at the end of the year, the general fund has to, to pay the child nutrition fund that amount. So that ends up coming out of the system general fund rather than child oh, nutrition. Okay. And our last policy for information is um, policy 8305, protection of pupil rights. And Mrs. Koval, who serves on the policy committee, as well as Mrs. Eastep, but Mrs. Koval had a concern or experience with this, and I'm gonna let her share uh, what her recommendations are. Well, uh, this uh, amendment to the policy sort of came about my, um, I have children in, in the public school system. I had one graduate, so now I have three. Um, but I have uh, students in middle school. And I was made aware of a survey that was distributed to um, a, a, a class um, that asked for some very sensitive uh, protected information. And that's defined in this um, policy, and I, and I certainly won't read that list of protected information, but you can imagine um, it's very sensitive information that was asked to uh, sixth graders. Um, and I received a phone call from a parent who actually happened to be a friend of mine, and um, she was very alarmed that she did not receive um, notification prior to her son taking this survey. Now, you know, the, the rules are, or the, the, the principal stated that the child could uh, opt out if, she, if he, he wanted to. He didn't have to take the survey. Um, but by the time he was in it, uh, it was almost too late. And you can imagine a sixth grader is not really going to stand up and, and sort of buck the teacher and say, well, I don't want to take this, um, this survey. So the question then became, you know, what is our policy uh, on, on um, parental permission? And um, currently, it is an opt-out form, basically. Um, which means that if you don't return the permission form or the form, um, that means that you've opted in. It means you've, you basically have agreed to allow your child to take the uh, survey. So <laughs> the concern was that some of those parents did not receive information, uh, didn't receive notice of it. And so we couldn't verify that the student, uh, that the parents had. So in order to sort of protect the parents uh, and the students from uh, having to take a survey like this again, we uh, decided to make a change to the policy and require that when a, a survey asks for protected information, that the parent uh, be notified and be required to fi uh, fill out a, an opt-in form, which basically means they send the form in and they have consented to allow their child to take the survey. So um, this way the parent is, um, we're sure the parent's informed because we got the, the form back. Uh, and that's that's basically the rundown. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Coble. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Dr. Holliday too if he'll talk a little bit about the procedure. Yeah, we can create the form um, once the policy is um, um, passed. The, the form would just simply be if the parent doesn't return the form, then the child doesn't participate in the survey. Whereas now, if the parent doesn't return the survey, it's assumed that they're okay with it. So what this would do was simply put the onus on the, on, the, on the parent and the child to make the, actually the parent to make the decision. And in the absence of any form re being returned, the child simply wouldn't participate in the uh, survey. And it just simply would mean we modify our form. Not a problem, <coughs> we can do that. So Dr. Holliday, because we won't meet again until after school starts, do we need to waive the first reading for this policy? Uh, yes, ma'am. I would recommend that if it would be all right with the board so that we can go ahead and get the form ready and get it out to the schools and, um, or get it on our website and get it taken care of. And so I, w I would recommend that, Madam Thank Vice Chair. Okay, I move to waive the first reading. Second. I have a motion and second to waive it. Any questions, comments? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, would someone like to make a motion to approve? I move to approve. Second. We have a motion to approve. Uh, 8305, any comments, questions? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is approved. Thank you. And that's the end of our uh, first reading. Thank you, Ms. Nichols. And if you have questions or whatever, feel free to contact the various individuals that 
that would be in charge of these areas. Uh, let's see, Thanks next the item on the agenda is item uh, B, board sponsored field trips, Appendix C, Dale Pelsey back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In accordance with policy 7552, this is the list of the board sponsored field trips. I will probably add additional after we have had opportunities to get more information from the museum. Ms. Coble uh, gave a great suggestion of another field trip, and we have been in contact with the um, person at the museum, but we need to get a little bit more information with the alignment as well as if there's a fee. Normally with the board-sponsored field trips, they are free to the students, and we pay for transportation. Last year, the museum did not charge and we've had some schools to attend so we want to talk to the first grade teachers about the quality of the program and also find out the sustainability because the field trips that we usually have on here continue year after year so we will be possibly bringing back an amended information list of board sponsored field trips thank you thank you Ms. Coble thank you Dan. Oh, okay, if you have any questions or suggestions, you can uh, contact Central Office. Item C, funding for school resource officers, Appendix L, Dr. Markley. All right, in the state budget, <coughs> there was seven, there have, they have set aside $7 million for grants that will be matched on basically a two-to-one basis. They'll give $2 for every $1 that we give. Um, they have not set out the criteria for those grants as of yet. As soon as they do, we will apply for those dollars. Uh, it's seven million dollars statewide, so I don't anticipate we would qualify for full funding. We'll probably we should we may be able to get some partial funding. We're further along in the process, I suspect, than other counties are in terms of in terms of readiness. But we can't take any action if we want to apply for this grant money because there's an issue about you can't use this to supplant what you already have. So as soon as the grant numbers, the grant process is in place, we will apply for the grants, and then uh, we'll uh, use our local funds to make up any difference. I wish I could give you a definitive timeline, but when I talked to DPI last week, they have not established the, the, the guidelines yet. Well, with the fact that we have all of our elementary schools covered now, and then with this proposal from the sheriff, which is going to be 11, could that be considered supplanting since we already have it in place? We don't have anything in place for, for this year other than middle and high schools. Right. So, but having had it in place... Now, those, last year really wasn't SROs. Last right. year was more of security because those weren't formally trained <coughs> SROs of the schools. There's a lot of deputies filling in, providing additional security. This would apply to SROs. Sheriff has trained SROs ready to go. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I think we're a step ahead of other districts that might apply. But if we want to apply for this funding, we've got to wait till the grant guidelines come out. And is this grant uh, in the budget for this year and next year? It's a two-year budget, so. I mean, but it, it you know, sometimes yeah. they put stuff in one year and it doesn't appear the second year, so. It was in there for both years as a recurring. Okay, all right. But ultimately, there's a possibility we may end up having to pick up. The whole, yes. Mm -hmm. But right now, we, okay. So who's, who's deciding on the grant proposals? Now in the hands of DPI or? It was in the, the education section of the budget, so that would be DPI. Okay, so, so we have to contact DPI about this. Yeah, we're waiting for them to, as soon as they release the guidelines. And then what, what is the total they've allocated for this statewide? Seven million statewide. Well, with the 115 school systems, do you think they'll break that up somehow to where there's a, a magic number that, uh, say, Charlotte-Mecklenburg, for example, could apply for versus, say, uh, Sampson County, uh, you know, a smaller county? They'll probably look at uh, poverty rates for the district in terms of need. They'll probably look at what's already in place. Uh, they'll look at readiness to implement the grant. Um, and at this time, in Mary Hazel, it's just speculation in terms of what could be the criteria. Um, with other competitive grants, you know, they're not allotted, so e every county has a, the same opportunity to apply. Some will and some won't, so it, it's hard to tell. Yeah, I just didn't know because you take a county, say like Sampson County, it's a much smaller, not geographically, but school-wise, compared, say, to a Charlotte-Mecklenburg or a Wake County. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if we, the percentage would be much higher because their security needs would be much higher, say, than Sampson County or even us. 
But the legislation does require the need-based component be part of the criteria. So, you know, they may wait, Sampson might wait more than, right. than Charlotte in that, that situation. And it may be a case this first year, a lot of counties just aren't ready to roll this out. Mm -hmm. And so we would be a little further ahead. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions on item C? Thank you, Dr. Markley. Item 8, superintendent's report. Any reports? No reports. Item 9, consensus items. Item A, personnel, appendix D, Dr. Wilmers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I request the board approve the personnel matters as presented. Move for approval. Second. Any comments or questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is approved. Item B, budget amendments, general fund budget amendment number one, and other restricted revenue fund uh, amendment number one, appendix A, Mary Hazel Small. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I request your approval of these amendments, um, both of which relate to carryover of um, program balances from last year to this year. Move for approval. Second. Any comments, questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. Item 10, under old business. Item A, Riceville Beach Baptist Church lease, appendix F, Mr. Hintz. Yes, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> this is a Riceville Beach lease which the board uh, previously approved. The uh, church uh, at Riceville Beach uh, requested some minor changes to it. Mr. Bullard has made those changes. The church has agreed with the changes. This is an, uh, the modified lease submitted for your uh, approval once again. Request that the board approve this. Move for approval. Second. Comments, questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. Thank you. Item B, Marine Science Academy Memorandum of Understanding, Appendix G, Dr. Markley. What you have is the original documentation and then some, re some revisions based on going through uh, legal, the legal folks at uh, both ends of the spectrum, ours and theirs, and I would request approval of the revisions. Revised MO, uh, MOU. Has this information been shared with the students as of yet? It is my understanding that the teacher was waiting to hear the approval of the MOU before she shared anything. Primary change for those just to, is in the original discussion, it was to be full credit for college credit for the courses that were offered. And instead, what's been done is they'll waive these two, two courses to allow students to take two higher level courses when they get to the university. The teacher did prepare a letter in the event to share that information. But the letter hasn't been sent yet? No. Okay. There's no other differences? I, I actually looked at both of them. I couldn't find any differences. That's the, pri that's the primary difference, yes. I, uh, were there any other differences? Yes, in what UNCW said that they would provide, yes. What, what are they, what, what has changed? That they would not issue college credit. Well, I know, no, besides that, is there any other changes to the program, the actual? No, sir. No. I, uh, <laughs> I raised a question. Um, this is an understanding, a memorandum of understanding with the University of North Carolina. Correct. I raised the question about utilization of Cape Fear Community College and some of their programs that may actually qualify as college transfer classes. At this time, we no longer have that agreement when we used to have that Huskins agreement. They're working on their MOU and there is no agreement from Cape Fear Community College for college credit. We're waiting for them to finish vetting it out with their side, so this time we're going to them first to make sure that they uphold what they say they're going to do before bringing it before you. What, who, what? Uh, community College. Cape, the like, Cape Fear Community College. We have an MOU that's right. in the works. And okay. there was no mention when I looked at what they were willing to do about offering college credit. Okay. They're offering facility and they're offering students to attend sessions as far as um, seminars or lectures but there was no language about offering college credit. So, <clears throat> the, and just to be clear, I mean, I know when I was there, every year we had to go, we went through the process of renewing Huskins. I'm, what I think I'm hearing you say is that prior, t up until this time, the school system 
that none of the marine science programs were part of the Huskins program. Is that In 2011, the legislative law changed. There's no longer a Huskins. It's called now Career College Promise, dual enrollment. Okay. They removed Huskins. So I, that's not even an I guess option. That's, the, that's, that's what I missed out not yeah. being at Cape Fear anymore. If you're right. In, prior to 2011, Huskins was, was a little more wide open in terms of what you could access for community college courses. Now they've narrowed that scope to a certain um, certain tracks for students who are going into the well, community Well, I, I knew they had taken college transfer as, I mean, the, the general education college transfer, but had left vocational technical classes that that were college transfer. They, they had previously left them. I didn't, right. and, and I find it interesting okay. in view of the governor's statements of his at least tacit support of what's done at the community exactly. college and teaching people tr uh, <coughs> occupational trades that they can utilize and get jobs with. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little surpri surprised the legislature uh, did not uh, take up uh, utilizing the community colleges any more than they, they did. There were some provisions in the, in the Senate bill r related to imp increasing access to CTE courses in general, but not community college specific. Okay. Thank you. The question I have, and Mr. Higgins, maybe you can help me with this, that in the marine science program, what I'm understanding, the way it is now, if they take those courses at uh, Ashley, then those courses are waived at UNCW, and then they could take to higher level, level. Yeah, to higher next level. Now, course. are there any courses at Cape Fear Community College that correspond basically to the two courses that would be waived at UNCW? They they have courses, but not that they would offer a student credit. Okay, because where I was going with that was that if something could be worked out with Cape Fear Community College, Mr. Higgins, then. Is that a say a backdoor way of getting those two courses approved? Well, that my, and that's my, what he was my, asking. my question mm -hmm. was simply because if UNCW was unwilling to give college credit, mm -hmm. there are classes that it's called a uh, kind of a general education program, but there are classes that are offered through the marine science program that do in fact qualify or have been accepted for college transfer. And my only thinking when I when I heard all of this about UNCW uh, was that if you have college, if, if you're in a program and you take a class that meets the criteria for college transfer, then you would get credit for it. Let me have a conversation with the community college president. Mr. Spring, Dr. Springs is very big on public school and community college partnerships. Uh, he may not be aware of where the MOU is in this process, and then I'll report back to you what, uh, what I get from Dr. Springs. Okay. Well, and you then can get, sorry, ahead, you can get um, credit now if you have over a certain SAT score. You can take, you, you qualify to take those classes. So, um, I mean, because my daughter's taking one this, this year at, at Cape Fear. So, I guess the question would be, again, if they would have the same sort of problem that UNCW does, that it's not one of their teachers teaching the course, then I, I you know, we're, we're at a stalemate. But if not, if they're willing to, you know, certify her, that, that might be a, a way to get the credit. So you could use it and at any college rather been, than just that's UNCW. That's been done in the past. But, where but to be clear, not all classes at Cape Fear Community College will transfer. Correct. See, so that was my the, question. The, the, well, you know, certain classes, <laughs> or in the, uh, what to call the TAC, that are college transfer. There are other classes that, that various programs have entered into arrangements with colleges to be able to be transferred. But as an example, you know, I spent 30 years teaching the paralegal curriculum, which for, in my opinion was a very academic program, yet we could never get a college to accept our classes as college transfer, right. primarily because in many instances, the university system, if you don't go to a private school, the university system views most of the classes offered at the community college as being equivalent to their junior, senior level classes, and they want to teach those classes 
rather than have the community college. They want the community college to teach the transfer classes, which are primarily English, math, science, the introductory classes. So it, it can get to a situation where sometimes these classes that they're very academic, there's no question about the qualification of the instructor. Ever, most of the instructors have at least a master's, if not a doctorate degree. But it's a case where the universities are somewhat reluctant to accept it. So that's the reason. Well, I would prefer that we go, uh, try to go the route of Cape Fear Community College, just because in this uh, memorandum of understanding, and I, I may not have read it correctly on the initial uh, memorandum, but I was under the understanding that the courses would the credit would apply to any state college not just uncw and so um no. you know if, if we if, if we were to go to cape for community college they would be able to transfer those courses yes. to any state college other than you know and uh, rather than just uncw but my only thinking is that except for maybe east carolina or or i don't know what elizabeth city state has that most of them would not have a marine science and if this was marine science it'd be uncw east carolina maybe well but they would have well, a chance like if masters. there's one in florida i mean oh, you know, yeah you yeah, could, they, you could they apply would. to have the, the credit sure. transfer oh yes yeah. so. uh, at this point let me talk to the community college cause well we i have, have the courses that they will accept college transfer humanities and social science business and economics life and health science engineer and mathematics those are the courses they will accept as college transfer so marine science does not qualify but weren't the courses, there was a science course and a, and a math course, was it It was not? the biology course and it was the um, marine science course. There were two specific marine science courses. Now they'll also take an AP course and that obviously if they, qual if they pass the AP exam will have college transferability. Right. But in terms of the community college MOU, let's have that discussion with the community college and, and we'll work that out. Well that discussion has happened. That's why we have an MOU in the, in the, in the pipeline and that was talking to the person at the community college that was not an option for well, these courses is there any chance of maybe kind of um tweaking the the i mean I, it, it's late in the game to do this now i mean unfortunately this has come up so late but in the future would it be possible to tweak the courses to adjust to classes that would be transferable such as biology or something along those lines so we could work with the community college where they could get credit because I think that's very important and that's the, the long-term plan of this is to match in our some of our okay. own AP courses with the marine science courses uh -huh. I mean the earth environmental AP course is a logical one so that as a junior you would take certain courses and then roll into the senior year taking some of those advanced courses so we're going to blend in our own AP courses with them for transferability. One of the things I saw, according to the information that we received, is that they questioned the credentials of the people that we would be have teaching the classes. I mean, very simple fix to that is that uh, anybody who's teaching one of these classes, AP or whatever, have at least a master's degree. That's always the issue with the university is that you have at least a master's or a doctorate and not uh, a bachelor's degree and so I would think that the uh, you know one quick fix might be to as part of the uh, uh, memorandum of understanding is that we would be prepared to say that we would not put an instructor with less than a master's degree in teaching one of these classes if that's what we want same thing is going to be true with K fear I mean K fear is going to expect there to be a master's if, if we're teaching it and you want to get it transferred, <coughs> if they're not getting it through Cape Fear, uh, they're not going to accept it either. It was my understanding from the uh, person who is over programs that that was an issue not having anything to do with the person's credentials, but being that they were not employed by UNCW. And so therefore, She's our employee, and, and then the power of the site that it's at Ashley, being that this was the, the, one of the programs that Dr. Markley asked the schools to come up with, her having a master's or even a doctorate was not going to help the students get credit. Because if UNCW taught the courses, of course, they would charge tuition. Well. I mean, that's, again, that gets back to the same thing, I think, with Cape Fear. Cape Fear would expect to teach. Of course, that was a nice thing about Huskins. I mean, uh, 
you had Kate your faculty teaching those classes. I, I, it sounds like what we need to do, as Dr. Marquez suggested, is meet with Dr. Springs and see what what we can work out potentially with Cape Fear because I think, you know, with all due respect to the people at UNCW, I think you will likely find Cape Fear is a lot easier to deal with. Yes, sir. You are correct. <laughs> but for right now, we're at the point where we yeah, the uh, have Cape this. Fear MOUs, not the one we're discussing. Tonight. Right. Okay. So uh, we don't have a motion, do we? Yeah. I do, thought we do we have a motion? I don't know, but I'll make a motion. We accept it. Second. We have a motion and a second. Now, are there any questions? <laughs> we'll do this one in reverse. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed? Approved. <coughs> Item C, Community Development Institute, CDI, Head Start Lease, Appendix H, Mr. Hans. Yes, <coughs> yes, Mr. Chairman. This is a CDI lease that uh, came before the board and was approved uh, already. Uh, since that time, CDI requested some uh, minor changes to the lease, but principally they changed the, uh, the lease period. Uh, Mr. Bullard made the changes. CDI has signed the lease and is presented back to you for approval once again. How did it change? Say again? I mean, you changed the dates, but how, how did that change? Why does that make sense? They just they took a month off the end. They, took, they wanted to end the lease in May rather than in June. They got to cover their 5% sequestration, so they shortened the lease. Right. They're, saving, they're looking to save, um, save dollars, so they're saving a month's worth of dollars. Can I make a suggestion? Um, oftentimes we're, you know, these things come before us and, and you know, a change has been made. Um, would it be possible to amend the document, maybe, you know, bolded letters, underscored, red, so that we can see what the change to the document was rather than having to dig through the previous one and compare to the Certainly. to the new one. Certainly, we can send you. We can give you a redlined copy because um, we always work with a with a redlined copy that shows the changes, and then we send the final document in for approval. That'd be, but we that'd can be very we can helpful. submit a redlined document anytime we do this for you to look at as well as a, a final. Just like we did with Paul's. Yes, that'd be yeah. that'd be great. Thank you. That's a good suggestion. Good. Mm -hmm. That'd be awesome. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Did we have a motion? I don't know what's going on. Yeah, we need a motion. Move we'll for approval. Second. You know, I'm about out of coffee, so I, I don't know. But, okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's approved. Thank you. Item D, proposed projects, 2014 bond program, appendix I. Mr. Hans. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, at the July um, meeting and at your retreat, uh, you discussed and uh, uh, looked at the modified uh, projects for the uh, proposed bond referendum in 2014, and these are submitted for your uh, final approval. Move for approval. Second. Comments and questions? Uh, Mr. Hayes, yes, sir. this found a wrench I want to throw in. Uh, <laughs> I guess the question is, there have been informal talks with the commissioners, and, and they're comfortable with the $160 million bond proposal correct so that's they've they've committed to that because you know my concern not is, formally well my concern is we have riceful beach down at the bottom and so you know if the commissioners come back and say we're only going to give you a hundred million dollars or, or we're going to give you 150 million dollars then riceful beach is out but now my understanding Dr. Markley was that this 160 came from them. That was the this figure was the they county, gave us. This was the county's number. And I would suggest that whoever makes the motion is that if the number is not 160 million, that we bring this list back yeah. for reconsideration. Yeah, we'll revisit this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that I would mean, address your concerns. See, I'm okay yeah. with that because, you know, uh, I just want to make, I mean, we can't let Riceville Beach go on the way it right. is indefinitely. And so we need to make sure that whatever we do in terms of a bond, it takes care of that problem. And so uh, no, I'd be fine with that because otherwise we probably should rework it. Yeah. Good point because you're right that we can't allow that to linger but that was the figure that we were given um, yeah and we we're trying to get a new uh, second uh, another break another meeting scheduled right uh, so the administrative folks or assistants are working on that and then shortly after that we'll have to bring together the two the joint meeting mm -hmm. so with the understanding dr hickey that uh, should the figure change we'll revisit this in order of priorities to make any adjustments necessary uh, I have a question. 
I raised the question about Blair. Are they? Are y'all putting together the information about what it would cost? Uh, actually, you got that Thursday. We got that. Oh, we have. Okay. It was a $14 million uh, replacement versus a $12 million renovation. I'd like to see what that $12 million is going for because I wouldn't, as it's, I said, I wasn't looking. In the pocket. Okay. It's in your pocket. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if, if you got, actually look at it, if you got questions, call either Mr. Hans or myself. Okay. And we'll be happy to. Any other comments, questions? Okay, we have a motion. Say all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? They're approved. <laughs> Item E, school based <laughs> mental health <laughs> services <laughs> contract, <laughs> Appendix J, Dr. Holliday. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I um, appreciate the thought that you all have put into this over the past couple of months as we've looked through this. Um, you tasked the superintendent and I to go back and discuss this with our health department partners, and we've done so. Um, had several meetings, actually. Um, what we've looked at is the fact that uh, the mental health contract has been reduced over the past several years. It started off back in the mid-2000s as about a $700,000 contract. We have added schools uh, since that time, and over the past uh, three years, the contract request has remained flat at $433,000. And when we went back and discussed this with our health department partners, they agreed to add two schools for the same cost uh, we're adding D.C. Virgo and Ogden Elementary School this year. Um, we're more than happy to discuss this with uh, our health department partners as we move forward for next year. Uh, we have some concerns about the fact that we do have so many children that um, need the mental health services. And in our community right now, there are not places for them to get it. Um, and the health department kind of stepped up and um, stepped into the void with the um, mental health system being um, deregulated essentially. Um, so I would respectfully ask that we've gone back and done what you've tasked us to do and would respectfully ask that you approve this contract. Move for approval. Second. 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 Comments, questions? You know, I didn't see the addition of two schools in the contract. I mean, uh, the the two schools will be Ogden and DC Virgo. Okay, I understand that, but that's not in the contract that we've been submitted tonight. And, and I do actually appreciate the fact that you've gone back and discussed it. I mean, one of the, one of the problems is there there is a real problem with you know mental health not being addressed in the community. Uh, but, but of course, you know, we need to be we need to spread our resources as far as we possibly can. Uh, for, for people who haven't been following along, uh, we spent $433,000 on mental health services. And uh, I guess in one of our prior packets, there are 549 students currently served. 580, I think it says, about 580. 580? Yeah. I thought it was 549, but in any case, you break it down, it's about $760, $780 per student served. Now, I understand mental health is, is important, but one of our concerns is that, you know, we don't know who's auditing, uh, I mean, how they have one person who is a fiscal support person. Is that person really recouping as much money as they can from the private insurance, from the, you know, government insurance like Medicaid and Health Choice? I mean, you know, I, I, I don't think anyone on the board particularly had a problem with funding mental health services. We just, like any contract we enter into, I guess I'm speaking for all of us, but we want to make sure that we are getting as much as we can for the amount of money we're spending. That's a very good question, Dr. Hickey. Dr. Markley and I, this past Friday, not, la not this past Friday, but Friday before last, had a meeting with the county manager and the leadership of the health department and also the financial folks at the county, not the, um, the health department, but the financial folks at the county. Um, and ask the, the very question, and we're all looking very hard at that to make sure that they are doing exactly what they say they are. And we'll, of course, keep a close eye on that this year because you've asked some very good questions, but we do would like to continue this program. And as we're going through next year's budget process, with the addition of a budget committee, we're going to add a presentation piece where if the board wants to hear from outside agencies prior to, to approving those, those partnership budgets, we're going to ask them to come in as well, so give you another opportunity to look at what they're doing in our schools. 
Yeah, and one of the problems with you know, all these outside agencies, and I'm not saying that there's a problem, but we don't supervise these people. You know, you, you or someone in your department doesn't have a direct supervisory capacity. So, at least in theory, you know, these positions uh, are full-time positions from when the schools open, from 7 a.m. to 3 or 3.30 p.m. But, but we don't know that people are working those hours as they're supposed to. And again, uh, because we, we're not in a supervisory capacity, which is was part of the problem with these contracts, it's difficult for the board to know are we getting what you know we're paying for. The, that's a good question. The principals certainly know, and if there are issues with this, they let me know. And um, we worked through an issue at one school this year, and the health department was very responsive. Um, and you know, the principal contacts me, and you know I have a direct line to the leadership at the health department, and uh, they get right on it, and they've been very responsive in that. So, but that's a very good question. I'd also like to see, I mean, we have, what, 25,000 students, and we're, we're servicing 580. I'd like to see if there is some way that they could maybe do something in more of a, I mean, I know there are some privacy issues, but if we have that need, you know, is there anything they can do in more of a group setting where they can serve more kids we're, um, we're, at one time? Yes, ma'am. We're going to explore those options. We've, we've opened those dialogues with um, the health department folks like I said we've had several meetings since the last one um, and we certainly want to maximize those services and they want to do the same thing okay and we do have contracts with some other agencies for specifically providing some of those services but primarily at Lakeside we've got a contract with an outside vendor with an outside agency that works with with them mm -hmm. so this 580 is served by them but these aren't the only students with mental health issues that were that we're serving in the county speaking of Lakeside and Lake Forest yeah. Dr. Martin. Lake Forest oh thank you sorry I would say Lakeside too, being as how that was my old school, so I'm <laughs> that too. Well, I think there's been some good suggestions made, and I appreciate the, the suggestions made by, uh, by my fellow board members. Any other comments? Or well, I mean, I, I for one do like the fact that we brought the concerns to the health department and we asked that they mm -hmm. could provide more services, and they came back with an improved, uh, uh, you know, recommendation. So, thank you. Uh, I feel better than I did initially. Thank you. Any other comments? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is approved. Item F, nurses contract, Appendix K. Dr. Holiday. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, we did as you uh, instructed and went back and um, asked um, what, who has the clinics in the three schools, mentioned the three high schools. Um, they were very thoughtful. Um, came back with um, a proposal at the same time letting us know that they really were not in the school health and it, it, it I don't do a really good job articulating this but school health and um, school nurses and school mental and, and school school nurses and uh, school health clinics school based health clinics are really two different things and we tried to provide you all with some information about that but what did do as, as we asked them to do and they came back with a proposal which was higher than what we would be paying for the school nurses. And if we were going to explore something like that, uh, members of the board, I would ask that we have uh, more time to do that rather than um, spend the time uh, or, or, to, or to put our high schools in a situation where they would not have a school nurse to open the school year. Um, but we're more than amenable to talking with the health department partners and our what partners as we move through it. And I will say that all three entities in New Hanover County Schools, the Health Department and what were all very collegial in this and, um, and, and understood uh, our position. Um, but at this time, um, it, Dr. Markley, I think, provided you with that information from what, um, but we would like to restore the three high school nurses and um, enter into some dialogue this year with is, is there a way we can reduce some costs but as, as as we've done we have been reducing costs to the school nurses over the past several years and we're trying to put some back in place and we've kind of held the line on it um, but we really need to keep our school nurses in those three high schools and would respectfully ask to restore those I'll move for approval but I do have a question after you get a second second okay, Mr. Higgins what's your question and, and I don't have a problem with doing it for this year, and I appreciate the fact that we will explore between now and next year 
And one of the things I was wondering is if we have explored the possibility, you know, I mean, I, I guess I, I assume that if, if I am subcontracting from somebody, more than likely they expect to make a profit on it. I mean, they've got overhead, they've got administrative expenses and everything <coughs> like that. Whether or not it might be beneficial for us to look at hiring our own nurses for these high schools or for some of these other things and paying them as school employees as opposed to having them, uh, renting them, if you will, through the, uh, through the health department. Now, I realize there'd be some, uh, some overhead we'd have to look at, a supervisor, uh, we'd probably have to contract, uh, I don't know, with a physician. Uh, but I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking that this is something we might would explore as, a, as a way of, for lack of a better description, cutting out the middleman. We can do that, but, but there are some things that having a, a health department nurse in your building really gives you uh, an advantage. H1N1 several years ago was a prime example. The health department put out the regulations around that, and there was those school nurses who then as health department employees as opposed to our employees could be much more forceful in making sure that we met those guidelines as they were as they were being implemented. Well, I think that's a case of, of whether or not we as a school system take on take the attitude of implementing and enforcing rules and regulations as opposed to uh, just I, I wouldn't suggest we just get these people and just stick them in them. I mean I have <laughs> expectations that that they would you know they, they would uh, perform duties as as these individuals do and I'm just you know it may be that when all is said and done and uh, and all the numbers are crunched that it might turns out to be more expensive to do this than it is to uh, for all intents to subcontract it out which is what we're doing now uh, but I just I think it is something that since this has been brought up it's something that needs to be explored just to see if in fact it would be more economical on us to to uh, to have our own employees as the school nurses as opposed to hiring them through the health department yeah, I mean, I, my only concern, and, and I mean, uh, I, I read all of the documentation that was sent by uh, you and Dr. Markley. Mo most of it, I mean, to be just perfectly honest, was were trade publications. So basically, the Association of School Nurses, uh, you know, sent their bullet points and the association of uh, school-based health systems, and you know, and both trade associations got together and said that. You can't, you know, one can't supplant the other, and uh, we're more efficient when we work together. So uh, it looks like their their presidents of their various organizations got together, and you know, they uh, everyone should work together, and everyone should keep their job, and that's a great thing. Uh, I'm not saying we we don't need, you know, there are certain children in the schools who have medical problems and would benefit from having a medical professional nearby. Uh, I, I still just can't wrap my head around why we need a nurse and then somewhere on campus at these schools that have a, you know, a Watt clinic, why we need to have both. I mean, if it's a real medical emergency, then we, we call 911 in either case. If it's just a, you know, a, a sinus infection or a bad headache or, a, you know, a bad stomach problem, well, then I, I don't understand why that person would be able to go to a, a Watt clinic. Uh, we're not talking about elementary school children. We're not talking about middle school children. We're talking about you know young adults, uh, you know, 15 year olds to 18 year olds. Uh, you know, I understand that kids are in school 180 days a year. So that means you know, 186 days a year, 185 days a year, whatever. Uh, they don't have a nurse, you know in the guest room in their home or, you know, at the, the house next door. So more than half the year, they're, they're doing this by themselves. Uh, you, you raise some good questions. The one thing that um, our school nurses do that the Watt folks can't do is um, manage our emergency medical plans and work with our children with IEPs um, because many of our children with IEPs have uh, severe medical needs and, those, and our school nurses actually manage those programs. So um, 
in the absence of those school nurses, we would have to develop a plan, and I'm not really sure what it would be uh, right now. So I, that, would, that would be my concern. Um, and certainly you raised some important questions, um, but um, at this point, um, I, I really believe that our high school nurses are um, valuable. I understand your concern, um, but mainly for our medically fragile children and in our high schools, we all have, um, they all have the classes with the children who have the severe medical needs that require um, actual nursing services. So um, our, our nurses actually assist us with that and help <coughs> us and actually in some cases keep us from, we do have to hire some individual nurses with our, I, with our IDEA dollars. As you know, I've brought those contracts forward, but because we have school nurses in our high schools, we have to actually hire less of those. So in, in some cases, it saves us money. I know that's a, you know, kind of a, a, a sideways argument, but I just wanted to kind of let you know that. Yeah, and I'm not saying they don't provide a, a valuable service. I mean, I, the, the only problem I have is that we, we work with limited resources. In fact, you know, we were just told at our last work session that the state budget is going to end up giving us about three million dollars less unless I heard that incorrectly. So based on the projected budget that we had, we're going to have to go back and find three million dollars in cost savings. Now, you know, we're, what that's going to translate into is that we're not going to have Cadillac academic programs. But we, we have all these other Cadillac programs, so we're going to have a Cadillac mental health program, we have a Cadillac, you know, school nurse program. Uh, you know, I guess I grew up, we didn't have school nurses. I remember I was in elementary school and we had a school nurse and then there were budget cuts. And they got rid of our elementary school nurse and then I never had one in middle school and I never had one in high school. And I know that there are districts around the country that don't have them. Now we've been fortunate that we've been able to keep the resources, but. You know, unfortunately, with, with uh, the economy and budget cuts, we are making cuts across all programs. Um, you know, I guess what I'm hearing from you is that this is not a cut that we want to make in the school system, but the, the problem is going to be, you know, there's going to be other cuts that we have to make, and I'm not sure we're going to be any much <coughs> happier about making those cuts. Well, we actually have been reducing our, as you've seen over the past several years, our nurse budget has been reduced. and. We just added a little back this year to, to cover some schools that really needed covering, like Virgo. Um, so we've really kind of held the line over the past couple of years. But in the decline, going back five years, we started reducing our school nurse services significantly. So we're still not back to where we were. So we still we still are below what our high water mark was. Well, again, going forward, I'd like to see. Uh someone work with Watt to see, you know, what it would cost just to manage the kids with medical IEPs. And then, you know, the other kids would either have to go to the clinic on their own that's available, or their parents would have to come pick them up, potentially, unless, of course, we start getting a whole lot more money from the state or federal government. Uh, because I just hate to see more and more academic cuts, which we're gonna, we're gonna have to make. You know, we don't have, we just looked at a budget of $160 million for really bare bones, you know, bond projects. So we don't have beautiful facilities. We need hundreds of millions of dollars in, in renovations. We don't have a lot of technology. We're actually asking children to start bringing their technology in from home because we don't have it. We, we haven't bought new textbooks. I mean, there are so many academic things that I'd like to spend money on. And, you know, it's all about choices. And unfortunately, with the way the budget goes, we're always making difficult choices. So that's, I guess, where I'm coming from. Any other comments? What is the rationale with um, using LPNs as opposed to RNs? Is there a regulation? LPNs can't be used as school nurses. Be in North Carolina or? Right. Well, I don't know about other states, but as, as my understanding of North Carolina law is LPNs cannot, cannot certify as a school nurse. Okay. Any other questions or comments? We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Thank you, it is approved. I've been asked that we take a five minute break, which will probably end up being a 10 minute break, but at this time we'll take a short break. <laughs> we'll try for five.
Yeah, no. No, it's fine. I appreciate it. Well, I'll th thank you. I was going to ask if you could elucidate a little bit more on some of the high need students we have. A lot of people don't I'm understand. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm not going to get it.